very much. Uh, I'm joined by four terrific panelists this afternoon. Farthest to my left is Trey Vassallo, who's a general partner at Kleiner Perkins. Uh, next in toward me is Dave Icke, who's the CEO of a company called MC10. We'll uh, see a little bit more about what he's doing in a few minutes. Uh, then we have Kerry Holly, who's an IBM fellow at IBM Research. And uh, next to me here is Frank Chen, who's a partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Um, so I'll start with, uh, with Trey and just ask, why now? I thought I got to go last. No, I'm sorry, um, since you're farthest from me. Uh, all right, all right. Now, this is actually something I love talking about. I was explaining backstage, I am an embedded systems geek um, out of Stanford, and was kicking myself for the longest time um, because I studied mechanical engineering, and I finally feel like my day has come um, because building connected devices is kind of seems like the latest and greatest new thing. The reason why I think it's finally happening now really comes down to smartphones. So now with you know, billions of these devices out there now, the cost to build a smart connected thermostat or light fixture is orders of magnitude different than what it even was two years ago. So there's the, the bits and pieces inside the phone that you know, are mass produced in such high quantity that it's now cost effective to put them in you know, sort of smartphone light stacks and embed them everywhere. But also, everyone now has an interface to the world in their hand. So we talk a lot about how now the internet is, our digital lives on the internet are very full. It's time to bring the rest of the physical ecosystem around us that is equally, if not more important, into that same wonderful digital paradigm. And so I think that's part of the reason why the technology is finally here and customers want that same kind of great digital interface. So that ligament is here. The connection to the network is here, yes. to the phone. Yes. Fantastic. Frank, uh, uh, Mark Andreessen um, has, has famously said that uh, software is eating the world, that software is all, that's right, you, <laughs> is it just, it's replaced by a gesture now, in fact, because it's such a crucial uh, thing that people say. Um, but now we're talking about devices a lot, connected devices, uh, hardware interfaces, things that act in the physical world. Is that a counter argument to the idea that software is eating the world? Well, that's a great question. And uh, we actually think of it as the complete embodiment of software eating the world rather than as the counter argument. So fundamentally, uh, these devices need to run software. They need to send their data to clouds that process that data. And so it's the whole ecosystem together, right? Hardware, network, a cloud storage solution that sort of analyzes and uh, takes action on it. And so you need all of those pieces together and um, uh, we couldn't be more excited. We're just like, Trey, on this, now is the time, right? Excellent, excellent. Um, and Kerry, you've, uh, you've worked with a lot of uh, big companies and governments at IBM. Um, big companies and governments, as it happens, have been uh, the leaders in a lot of connected devices for, for some time. I mean, the idea of an instrumented jet engine is, uh, is not new, right? But, the, uh, but this area feels like it's accelerating. So what's, what's going on um, among these sorts of companies that's bringing about a renewed interest in connected, connected devices? Well, I think the, um, uh, the big interest in, in large companies in, in connected devices is wearable uh, computers, uh, this whole concept of Internet of Things. Most large companies are trying to continue to grow. They're all tr they are trying to have a very uh, unique, differentiated customer experience, uh, one that enables uh, them to grow, uh, retract, uh, attract more customers. So to a large extent, uh, what we find is a lot of organizations are trying to uh, engage uh, differently. And, uh, and most companies, which we agree with, uh, which we are pushing as an agenda, uh, we actually believe that you know, looking at the, uh, uh, these trends as macro trends is interesting but the actual uh, convergence and uh, confluence of those trends is actually more interesting in terms of, uh, you know, when we look at mobile and social and analytics and cloud and context-aware computing and artificial intelligence, when we look at all of those trends collectively, we see a, a much more powerful uh, experience. But at the heart of that uh, are uh, all these endpoints, and these endpoints are uh, only limited by the imagination of, of you and I. Hmm. Do, do bigger companies enjoy any advantages over... Uh over startups and sort of developing uh, interesting connected, uh, connected devices, connected world type technologies? I don't know if they uh, offer an advantage. I think uh, we're seeing a shift in the uh, marketplace. Uh, what most uh, large companies are experiencing is that these companies that we can describe as born on the internet or born on the cloud mm -hmm. uh, have increasingly uh, created these uh, web-based platforms as, as strategic control points. Mm -hmm. They've increasingly uh, 
uh, through media and other uh, venues have shown uh, new channels to market and they've shown a, uh, uh, an opportunity for innovation and collaboration that's been fundamentally different than what big companies have done. But I, what we're seeing is a shift, this whole democratization of, of IT, the consumerization of IT is causing uh, Fortune 500 companies to recognize that they can no longer innovate within the four walls of their company, that they will actually have to uh, not just use third parties like IBM or, or, or Google or whatever, they're actually going to have to embrace a, uh, an open community. So that's the, the shift that we're seeing in the, uh, in the marketplace. So they're pushing, uh, they're pushing openness. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, and uh, Dave, I'd love you to, to explain to the audience a little bit about uh, the technology that your company is, is, is developing. And I understand we have some uh, photos uh, set up as slides that we can put up on the screen. Sure. Um, well, MC10 is a venture-backed company. We're based in, on the East Coast, Cambridge, Mass. And what we're trying to do is take um, conventional computer chip technology out of rigid, boxy packages um, with the premise that Moore's Law is not enough, that if you want to interface with soft tissue on the skin or inside the human body, you need to take it to, to another level. And so um, you, know, you can see there are a couple slides that show um, conventional chips being thinned and then deployed in new soft form factors. We've focused first really on interfacing with the human body and being able to deploy sensing, um, some computing, and then ultimately the ability to deliver a targeted therapy um, really anywhere on the skin, depending on what you're trying to measure, or you know, eventually even inside the body. So um, we're in the process of, you know, I guess, capitalizing on this wave of distributed computing. We can certainly do it in industrial settings as well, um, but oftentimes, you know, a rigid boxy thing is okay to attach to um, a piece of industrial equipment. Most of us don't like to tolerate, you know, wristbands or chest straps or, you know, things on our heads. So if you can, I think, lower the barrier to uh, adoption of wearable computing, you have an opportunity to really accelerate deployment uh, of what you can do in terms of connected healthcare, um, wellness optimizing activity, and also um, participating in the internet of everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A, lot of, uh, a lot of healthcare challenges, right, come down to getting the patient to just follow the, uh, follow the prescribed treatment, like sure. applying something to your skin. Sure, I mean, compliance, um, compliance is a big issue, whether it's taking a medication or doing a, a follow-up. Uh, if you think of a cardiac patient discharged and what a Holter monitor looks like, or if you've ever done a stress test um, you know, in the EKG lab, today you know, you, you're um, clipping huge belts with heavy you know, pieces of equipment onto you, multiple electrodes with lots of wires hanging off, same thing you know, when a child is in the NICU. Um, mm -hmm. So if you can break that paradigm, use the power of wireless, use the, um, the progress that micro microelectronics has made in you know, giving the power into the smartphone, but instead remove that boxy form factor and interface with the body in a new way, I think you mm -hmm. can unlock lots of applications. Do you think the big institutional buyers of uh, you know, health healthcare devices, the hospitals, the insurance companies, uh, see the promise in this? Are they are they uh, willing to willing to fund thing, willing to buy things like this, or are they still too risk averse at this point? Um, you know, I think that um, there's no question that there's something that has to change in the healthcare system, um, and getting access to care in an episodic way every once in a while when we go to the, the hospital or the clinic um, or when we happen to end up in the emergency room when something bad happens is a pretty inefficient way to access care. So, you know, it rides along the same, the same lines as some of the interconnected systems for optimizing um, performance or efficiency that we, you know, that we see in factories or in transportation. Um, same kind of thing happens if we can be connected all the time. We can catch things before they become a big problem. We can right. notify healthcare providers or notify you, and you can get attention um, much more proactively. And so interoperability becomes a crucial uh, factor in that, in that model then, right? Yeah, absolutely. And so no, no single company, especially not a startup, is going to figure the whole thing out. Um, but it really does require an ecosystem where you know, big companies and you know, motivated players in different parts of, uh, that are attacking different parts of the problem can work together with you know, some common standard and common vision of where this needs to go. Can I piggyback on? Of course. 
So one of the things we're really excited about, sort of as we think about where wearable computing is really breakthrough user interfaces, mm -hmm. because the you know anybody who has typed anything for a long time on their phone knows that this is not going to be the last word in UIs, right? And so if you think about wearable, you think about gesture recognition tied to natural language processing, tied to you know sort of intuitive interfaces where you can just sort of wave your arms and uh, you know. It, it, Look, the keyboard and mouse have dominated our world for longer than you would have thought. Uh, mouse mm -hmm. got invented right near, near this building. And uh, you know, the opportunity to meld vision plus natural language processing plus gesture recognition to do something that is very intuitive is a great opportunity. And uh, well, and, and we have uh, Trey over <laughs> here on the end who's wearing I'm what is glasses. still at this point a very conspicuous uh, yes, device. Yes, yeah, I am a walking wearables lab, actually, <laughs> and, and I'm embracing the full geekiness of it. I've got every wrist, uh, you know, uh, band known to man. I've got a Jawbone, a Nike. Um, currently, I have my Basis, and then I've been test driving Glass for the last three weeks. Um, just quickly on the, so I think there are going to be a couple of wearable categories that emerge. Um, we're already hearing a lot about it. There's a lot of speculation around the wrist and what the big platforms are going to do around the wrist. Mm -hmm. um, I am super excited about that for a number of reasons. First um, is that this is highly socially acceptable. It may be ugly, but it's really easy for me to wear a watch. And the thing that I've learned, especially about wearing glass for the last three weeks, is the hands-free, always-on nature of um, my access to the internet through my glasses is truly transformative in a way that you, it's hard to explain. You actually have to experience it. And I can be doing anything, and with a command, I can super easily send myself an email, send someone else an email, uh, get directions. And that is really, really powerful. Um, you know, and, and I think. What's exciting is that that means there's new platforms being built that have very different inputs and outputs, like you were saying. What is different about glass and what's going to be different about watch platforms? Well, they're going to be very motion motivated or motion driven or audio driven. Um, and uh, it changes things in a really fascinating way. So the reason I'm excited is, look, these are baby steps into a whole new area. and. You know, they're, they're quite kludgy right now. And I, you know, I'm still amazed that these wristbands have sold as well as they have. There's only so much you can do with an accelerometer. It's not that interesting in the grand scheme of things. And, um, and frankly, number of steps, you know, like do I really care about the number of steps I take every day? Well, sometimes I do. But the mass population is not going to be engaged and motivated by that on a daily basis. But would I love something to tell me how to live better and smarter and then socially compare me to my peer group and give me advice? Absolutely. And so with new sensors and new configurations, you know, that is in our very near future. And that I find incredibly exciting. And do you, so do you think the value in things like, uh, like the glass, the, the wristwatch uh, yep. pedometers, is going to go to the companies that are making these devices or that are uh, sucking the data in and then learning a lot about, about you as the wearer? Well, I, so personally, I mean, I think it's going to be a combination. I think there will be several parts of the market where, um, you know, let's just take Nest as a great example, because that is one of our portfolio companies, and that's a perfect example of, you know, a really smart team that identified, um, you know, a mundane product that everyone has with, you know, 40-year-old technology, and they said, you know what, we can reinvent what a thermostat really means, and so, um, you know, I think there's there's stuff all around us that is you know, just hasn't gone through that transformation right, yet. And right. so I think there are opportunities for startups to, to really focus on something that is transformational and be a big company. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the big giants have woken up. And right. I think what's going to be so exciting is you know that there's, you know, Google's doing something, there's rumors Apple's doing something, Microsoft's probably doing something. So it's going to get pretty exciting from a platform standpoint, I think, in the near future. Right. And, and I'm, I, so, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I was just going to add that I also, I mean, I agree fully, and I also think the, the ecosystem does have enough room for a lot of players. So in the scenario that, that was just mentioned, uh, clearly the device manufacturers are going to win. The uh, platform providers are going to win as well. Uh, but also the, uh, the organizations who provide to consumers. So if we look at um, medical facilities, hospitals, uh, it's a big win for them in terms of lowering costs, in terms of better diagnostics, in terms of better health care. Uh, if we look at the uh, cross-industry uh, relationships that will grow, 
in terms of healthcare and let's say grocery chains. Uh, there'll be a big win for, for those two in terms of uh, perhaps more healthy eating, uh, the scenario you described, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, wanting to, to get data, uh, and not just data, insights is actually what you're looking for, yeah. which is what Trey yeah. mentioned, insights that would actually improve your life. So the consumer wins, uh, the organizations that provide mm -hmm. those insights that win, and, and those organizations are going to be multifaceted. They're not going to just be one industry. It's going to be multi-industries. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and, and Frank, uh, as, a, as an investor, are you interested in, in platforms or in the companies that own the user experience? Well, you hit upon probably the most active debate that we have internally about this right now, <laughs> which is, is it horizontal, right? Is there going to be an Android of the Internet of everything, right? And there's this base software, and then lots of people innovate around it. Or is it going to be vertical, right? So companies like Nest, who, you know, Tony Fidel pops out of Apple and builds exactly what you would expect an Apple alumni to build around thermostats. Yep. Beautiful, engaging, completely hermetically sealed, right? Like it's not a platform to run other people's software. And that is really fundamentally the biggest question, which is where is the value going to uh, emerge? And as an investor, you're trying to point, pick the place where all the value gets created. And I would say, look, it's an open question right now. Um, you know, the, in the long sweep of our uh, industry, openness and horizontal has won, right? Now, over the last five years, we had this blip where the most valuable company on the planet got created on vertical, right? Which is, I'm really in charge of my ecosystem. And so, for the first time, Apple demonstrated that you could build a ton of value by controlling, tightly controlling everything from the operating system to the store, to payments, to the end user experience, right? So, right. It's, it's an open question and the one that we are most actively debating internally right now. Excellent. I would just add that I think the user experience has to be mindlessly simple mm -hmm. for this to be broadly adopted, right? And um, so you, you're not going to be able to neglect the user experience. And even if there are collaborations uh, and, you know, sort of an open environment and a set of standards where people are collaborating, um, the user experience to move beyond the early adopters yep. has to be super simple. And that is not, it's not an easy problem, especially when you start looking at things like healthcare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and on, the, on, on the continuum between sort of a, a point solution and a platform, where is MC10? Well, we're, um, I mean, it depends how broadly you define the problem, right? So if you think about, for example, connected health, there are lots of companies that are doing wireless connectivity and smartphone apps and big data in the cloud and trying to d derive the insight back to the user. We're focused on seamless sensing, which is the kind of front-end input yep. to that and, make, and really lowering the hurdles for doing that. Um, we're trying to do that across, across a number of different problems and in industries. So we think of ourselves as a platform technology, but we have a very focused piece of that overall solution that we're contributing to. And I was just going to add that, uh, I mean, we as a company have a pretty long history of, of, of vertical success and seeing the, the downside of that. And so I, I think actually from a market standpoint, we'll see the ebbs and flows. We'll see companies, you know, with vertical solutions who will make a lot of money. But uh, we actually believe that, uh, that the industry is in a transformational stage right now. And you and I talked about this a little bit before, but we believe fundamentally uh, that if we go back in time, that we started with this, uh, uh, you know, this sort of electronic or uh, pre-electronic uh, mechanical uh, uh, tabulating machines. Mm -hmm. Then we went quickly to programmable uh, computers, which is where we are now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we believe that uh, we'll, we'll quickly move to this era, era that may not stick in terms of what we call it cognitive computing. Uh, but it is fundamentally different. It is the uh, sense and respond. It is the insight. It's, uh, it, it, it moves away from von Neumann's model, where you organize a computer around uh, memory and processors and, and CPUs and, and, and so forth, to a model that uh, is software-defined, that embraces uh, visual analytics, embraces uh, big data, embraces uh, machine learning, uh, embraces context-aware computing. So that's the, uh, and that's the world that we actually see. And we believe that if you look at each of these areas, they last about 40 to 50 years. We think we're in the first one to five years. Who knows? Maybe it's year one, maybe it's year five. But we believe we're in, the, in an inflection point, And the actual transformational opportunities are enormous. But if we, uh, and we won't be the single company that pushes that forward. It'll be everyone on this panel and everyone in this audience collectively in their efforts and, and contributions. But the point I'm making is that, uh, that if we look at this at a micro uh, stage, I think we limit our... Uh, understanding of the possibilities of the, of the impact it'll actually have to our lives, to cities and, and societies. So you actually see this as a change in the type of computing to something that's better suited to interacting with the physical world. Actually, exactly. Excellent. And I also see, you know, even though we talked about uh, two worlds, digital and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, I don't know what was the second one, physical we called it? Or, mm -hmm. But we actually see three worlds. 
there's, uh, there's the, the world of, uh, we call the world of physical, um, you know, all the stuff that's got embedded devices, Internet of Things, everything that's sort of physical that you can touch and feel. And then there's us as people, that's a world as well. And then there's the world of, of things that we, we built, software systems, uh, IT. But those are three distinct worlds that we see that are actually blending today into, mm -hmm. uh, into a powerful uh, new opportunity space. Excellent. I would love to come back to the nest, um, because this is something that we've brought up a handful of times. And, uh, and also, we had a nice talk from Alex Hawkinson earlier today. Yes, um, who's, who's I, running away, I see. Yeah. <laughs> Bye, Alex. And I always enjoy hearing Alex's presentations, because I think he lays out a very compelling yeah. argument for how, for the value of platforms. Absolutely. The value of, um, you know, bringing uh, the physical components into an abstract relationship with the software. You're an investor in Nest, though, yes. which, which we yep. often talk about as being on the opposite end of the spectrum from smart things. Uh, and I think that's exactly right. They're two very extreme ends of, of a spectrum where I think there's a lot of opportunity. I think I'm, I'm a huge fan of what the smart things guys are doing and think that it could be entirely complementary to an ecosystem that emerges. Um, you know, in, especially in emerging new areas, Vertical solutions are, are kind of needed to, to pave the way and show people what's possible and what can be done, um, which is, I think, oftentimes why you see these vertical opportunities arise. When you, customers want to buy something that works and they want to buy something that solves a problem. People don't buy platforms. They buy, this thing's going to help me do X. And oh, I'm really happy because it's going to do all these other things too. And so I think the key for platforms is you know, first of all, getting some of those developers on the platform, creating momentum, but then ultimately it's about creating solutions that really resonate with groups of people that are excited by it. Um, and the thing that I think is exciting by what Alex and the Smart Things team are doing is that, you know, there are more things in a house that you could ever think about tweaking or designing for. And, you know, there could be three huge nest companies out there and they're probably not going to make the you know connected coffee pod or the automated dog feeder but there's going to be a bunch of people that want that and and so you know to have that ecosystem that enables that i think is pretty darn yeah. cool silicon valley has a way of uh, designing the products that silicon valley wants to use itself and uh, <laughs> yeah. occasionally that's true and so know, that, that is one of the questions right right, it's, right. okay it, it yeah. feels very you know there's something here but the question is how how Right. Yeah. Broad I know a lot of Google yeah. engineers, and their preferences yeah. are not identical to the preferences <laughs> of the American public as a, yeah. as a whole. So. Yeah, and, and I will say I've wreaked some havoc on my family, too, in deploying <laughs> a lot of this technology in the house. People, I, I've right. been getting some flack. So. Mom, are you recording me now? <laughs> <laughs> Look, we're having a big sort of revenge of the nerds moment here, right? Which is, you're, you're, you're right that sort of Google engineers don't represent mainstream, but like for a generation, Hollywood taught us what normal and mainstream was going to be, and I think there's an element of that that's sort of coming back to Silicon Valley, where Silicon Valley is going to teach what mainstream behavior is going to be. So, you know, a good example of that is we have a, an investment in a company called If This Then That, and if that's not sort of a Revenge of the Nerds titled company, <laughs> I don't know what it is, right? But it's a programming framework that allows you to sort of connect any web service to any web service, right? If you see this post on Craigslist then email me. If I get tagged on Facebook, then um, uh, tweet, retweet it, right? And the whole internet of things is dying for a platform like this, right? When I open the garage door, then turn on my stereo, turn on the thermostat, right? So there needs to be a programming framework that allows us to stitch all of these internet-enabled coffee pots and garage door openers and washer dryers together. And so I think, you know, it, it's not far-fetched to think that in a few years, mainstream people will be doing rudimentary program, programming of exactly that sort. Mm -hmm. Right, and then we'll have reached our sort of revenge of the nerds moment. <laughs> right, right. So I'd love to turn from uh, from consumers to government for a second. And you've worked with uh, uh, governments uh, at, with IBM on things like smart cities uh, initiatives. What do you see governments wanting out of uh, connected world? Um, are they are they willing to take uh, risks on new technologies around sort of the Internet of Everything? Um, what do you see there? Uh, so uh, multi, multi multiple questions. The answer is yes in terms of risks. Mm -hmm. um, the, the challenges governments have, uh, we see in the United States, but we see elsewhere, is they have limited funds and they have uh, lots of uh, both political challenges and social challenges. So, but what we see is, uh, you know, each city um, has a different set of problems. So in Singapore, we, uh, we saw a city that didn't believe that you could actually 
identify patterns to actually make a difference with, uh, with traffic, but, but you could. You could actually use not just smart uh, technology in terms of, of traffic lights and, and so forth, uh, so intelligent uh, traffic lights, but you could also use pattern uh, and data analysis to actually make the city actually go faster. I mean, who knew that, that you know, m that, that, I don't know the ex exact algorithm, but there's a, uh, you know, most traffic problems in cities are caused by people looking for parking spots. Mm -hmm. So if you can um, actually direct the, a person to a parking spot faster, you can actually alleviate the traffic. In, uh, in Brazil, we did a project, we have a te piece of technology called Deep Thunder. Uh, and a lot of people have heard of Watson and Deep Blue, but, but Deep Thunder is a piece of technology about weather. Where, uh, and, and, and in Rio de Janeiro, where the Olympics are coming, uh, they're very concerned about uh, many things. They're concerned about uh, crime, they're concerned about weather conditions. Uh, and so, for example, uh, maybe I don't want that uh, Olympic diver to jump off the, the board at this particular time if the wind uh, is going to be at a certain. Uh, so, if how do you predict that? In the area. Uh, no, yeah. no, not lightning in the area. You're actually <laughs> using data based on a weather pattern that the national weather or whatever has forecasted to be able to take that plus what's actually happening through sensors on the ground at the moment mm -hmm. uh, within a few minutes or hours be able to pinpoint what the actual condition will be for that diver at that point in time. So system-wide intelligence um, yes. applied to yes. um, in a very concrete way. Yeah, so I, those were a couple of examples but, uh, but we're seeing cities um, embrace um, uh, technology for uh, making uh, citizens live better. Uh -huh. uh, we, we did a project in New Orleans, I did a project in New Orleans for this very purpose. So uh, we're seeing cities uh, very eager uh, to invest, uh, very eager to, uh, uh, to see the returns of being able mm -hmm. to uh, use technology in innovative ways. They have a lot of physical assets to control and measure and so forth. They do. A lot of manhole covers to, uh, to, send, yes. to instrument. Yes. Well, um, I'd love to have some questions from the audience. Um, if we could just bring up the lights a little bit and prepare, uh, I think there are microphones. Um, sir, yeah. Virtual currency and digital currency, um, the, the, how you see virtual currency and digital currency meshing in to the Internet of Things? We're working a lot on machine-to-machine -machine payments. I'm just wondering how you see that happening, That's especially with regard to OpenCoin, which you guys just invested in at Anderson. Yeah. Um, so we're big fans of the digital currencies. We're starting to place small bets right in and around the Bitcoin community, like with OpenCoin, and we think that, uh, you know, sort of, another revenge of the nerds type uh, invention, right? Which is instead of fiat currencies from governments that can keep on printing money, let's invent a digital cryptography based currency that basically has a fixed supply and can't inflate, right? Just sort of by nature of the currency. Nobody can run the printing press on Bitcoin. Like the mathematics don't allow it. So we're big fans of that concept. And you know, the big question is, how and when does that go mainstream, right? And I think sort of the intersection between digital currencies and machine to machine is it's tied to the whole, like, well, when it, will it become mainstream, right? It's got to get consumer adoption, right? So, and, uh, so, as you know, Bitcoin passed a billion under management, and in 10 days it was 2 billion. Um, but, you know, there's some real f problems with Bitcoin in terms of the way that it's, the architecture is created. And one of them, depending on if you're a human optimist or not a human optimist, is the ability to control that. So our currency, VEN, runs through a central reserve and it's 100% backed by commodities, carbon, and other currencies. So it's fundamentally the opposite of Bitcoin. But I'm just wondering, like, do you see, like, because the, the idea that Bitcoin is not actually backed by anything and that it's anonymized means that corporations can't really use it right now. So how do you see that adapting to become something that people could actually use in the kind of light economy versus the dark economy? Yeah, I mean, I think sort of evolution of any sort of payment system or currency is going to come down to adoption. So that's what I was saying earlier. Like, how do you get people to uh, adopt it? And there's always a chicken in the egg, right? Do you start with the merchants who will accept it? Do you start with the people who have it? Uh, and I think that's just an open question, right? Of how you incent people to change their behaviors around how they pay, right? I'd love to make sure we have time for a couple more questions. Anyone, anyone else have a question for our panelists? Uh, yes, in the back uh, there on the aisle. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Barney Pell uh, with Quick Pay Corporation. I'm really enjoying the panel. So my, my question is, uh, all of this um, Internet of Everything requires data connectivity. What do you see as trends where everything will actually be connected? You know, for example, is it sort of city Wi-Fi, um, you know, low, bra low bandwidth or low energy, uh, you know, Bluetooth and stuff, so that everything can re reliably be connected to everything else? Carrie, would you like to take this one? 
I will take a partial stab at it and let my <laughs> colleagues here expand. I, I think that, uh, I mean, there's, uh, throughout the conversation of the day, there's been a lot of conversation about the, uh, the physicalness and, and the physics of connecting everything and the speed at which that will occur based on spectrum and blah, blah, blah. But I think that um, uh, we are seeing and we are witnessing this uh, API economy that's forming. And I do think that this, uh, <coughs> this notion of using this web API, the web as a programmable platform, uh, actually provides a great opportunity to, um, to create uh, greater connectivity uh, in an open and, uh, and, 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 and a way to allow us, as you say, to stitch, to assemble, versus having to custom develop everything. On, on, and, and a lot of that's going to be able to be, do, uh, be, be very dynamic and be done on the fly. Barney, I think this is going to sort of play out like Obama's energy policy, where he wants all of the above. And, and I think that's what's going to happen with sort of internet connectivity, right? In the house, it's going to be Bluetooth low energy, plus Zigbee, plus Z-Wave, plus Wi-Fi, plus you know, things that haven't been invented yet. Um, and similarly, for metropolitan areas, there's going to be Wi-Fi, there's going to be line of sight, there's going to be microwave. And the challenge is that we put a software layer over that so the developer doesn't have to care. Right, and uh, um, you know that's that's sort of the, the thing that we're looking forward to. Radio agnostic, maybe a little software defined radios, so we don't have to ship new custom design radios into every device, and then a software layer that makes it uh, makes it so that you don't care how things are connected. Dave, as you're developing medical devices where it's crucial that they are you know um, low impact, uh, do you find that the technology for uh, for for radio communication that you need is available now? Um, yeah, I think it is. There. It comes down to a trade-off between how much data you're trying to communicate and upload to um, to a smartphone or to the cloud and how much you try to compute locally. So you have to be thoughtful in architecting a system as to um, you know what the power budget looks like and how much how you want to deploy that. But I think there are there are good alternatives already, and you know technology trends will start to or continue to drive lower power and higher bandwidth. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for joining me on the panel today. And uh, this has been a terrific conversation. Thanks. Thanks.